special guest with us. We have Mr. Rohit Pathak, who is currently the CEO of Birla Copper. Prestige around uh, you know the consulting firm was the fact that it gave you diversity of experience. You know, worked around uh, in many other geographies, and uh, I think uh, yeah, it shaped or has been a bit big part of. my professional journey on you know where i am today i think a lot i owe to those 10 years at mckinsey so i think one was uh, you got uh, you got a good practice of looking at a industry and quickly getting a sense of the key drivers in the industry i am a bit of a uh you know long innings guy so i'm not a person who is even at mckinsey i was there for 10 years if i had not done my mba i would have probably stayed on at analog for a longer time so i'm not one of your job hoppers uh in general because to me management is not about taking a great set great set of people and doing great things right as in to me leadership and management is about taking an average set of people and doing something great By and large, if you look at the large leader statistics, world is still growing at two three percent. So it is not actually going through a recession. There are parts which are going through a challenge, but overall the growth seems to be still fairly okay. Uh, having said that, yes, I think there are strong headwinds in Europe, uh, US. Uh, you know, though doing well, but you know, facing some challenges. So yeah, I think as a world economy, we are going through a lot of restructuring that is happening. Uh, credit to the government and the way. they pick in some tough policy decisions to set the right base for driving this growth <coughs> in terms of what they're doing so i think one i do see uh, india and india's role in the next uh, 10 10 12 years will be very uh, important in the global economic uh, landscape and hence a lot of opportunity for everyone here to contribute and do well as people get used to using ai right we have to ensure that we as humanity don't lose the human intelligence hmm. right? right and the human connect you know today's generation feels more comfortable talking to a computer than to humans game safari is our uh, wow. go to list for most holidays whether in india or outside hmm. uh, and uh, i would again love to go there Um, I think that's it. on the bucket list. We Tanzania and Serengeti with my family was an op, uh, on my bucket list, which we just did last year. But I don't mind going there again. Hello everyone. So welcome to another episode of the Bits Weekends podcast. And today we have a very special guest with us. We have Mr. Rohit Pathak, who is currently the CEO of Birla Copper. So I welcome you, sir, to this podcast. It's really a pleasure uh, e meeting you, and glad to be interacting with you. Thank you, Ambuj, and I wish we could have done it in person. It's always much better Same meeting man. in person. But I, I guess uh, you know e is good enough these days. Right. Right. no worries sir sir so uh, let i would like to start with your childhood so please let us know uh, where were you born and brought up what did your parents do and then how did you get into engineering and at bits pilani sure so look i am a army kid uh, my father's in the army uh, most of my childhood has been spent in small army cantonments all around the country uh, we've been to all parts uh, of the of, you know north south east west i think we've covered it all and uh, i think the interesting part of that was that you one got to understand though that time you didn't really appreciate but you got to see a lot of rural uh, and hinterland india uh, from different parts and different cultures every year or every two years we were moving uh, you were changing schools uh, every school was a different set of people uh, so you got to become very adaptable and uh, i think army life or defense uh, kids life is quite interesting 
So we had a great time, uh, you know, uh, studied in KVs and army schools throughout. Uh, my final few years were in Pune, uh, where I finished my 12th. And, uh, you know, sort of generally my life has been a lot around what I don't want to do versus what I really want to do. Uh, I was clear, uh, you know, there were a few areas which I didn't want to get into. And uh, I was a little more inclined towards engineering. Uh, you know, probably as army kids, you got exposure to typically only just two, three areas, right? And every cantonment had its own, uh, uh, own I would say, pet uh, job uh, for people to go to. So there was a wave of merchant navy. There was a wave of uh, okay. uh, hotel management. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously engineering and doc uh, being a doctor were two uh, standard line. So somehow I got a little more keen towards going for engineering. I was always good in maths and uh, uh, the sciences. So I thought that's something that I will also do well in. So, uh, you know, I did my 12th. Uh, uh, I got fairly good marks uh, in those days. You know, uh, mid to early uh, or early to mid 90s was a very good uh, percentage. Unfortunately, we didn't have so many entrance exams. Uh, so, you know, I got admission into some of uh, the good colleges in Pune, uh, uh, COEP and uh, so in the Bharati Vidya Peet and some of those others. And then um, those days, as you know, BITS used to have admission basis 12 marks. So someone, you know, told us, look, why don't you look at BITS? And, you know, Pilani, when I not really heard of it, the Birla name was known, but Bits Plan, even I had no clue uh, how good or bad it was. And I applied and I applied for the top two, I think, computer science, electric, elect electronics and mechanical, and then put the B group, right, which is maths, was my favorite. And I got into mathematics. And then was the dilemma, right? Do you join Bits in mathematics where you don't know what engineering you'll get? Or do you go to a COEP, which was fairly good? Uh, stay at home and do electrical electronics, what you wanted. And uh, I didn't know too many people from BITS. There was just one senior uh, who was a family friend's uh, daughter uh, whom I knew. And I said, okay, we spoke to her and she said, no, it's a good uh, college. I've spent a year. It's it's a nice place. Go for it. So we just took a call and uh, went to, decided to take on Pilani and see how it goes. I still remember my father went to drop me there and uh, you know, we got off the train in Jaipur and from there we took a okay. bus to Pilani. And uh, it was late in the night. Uh, we got to the Pilani bus stop and the bus stop and the guy said, okay, Pilani has come, you get off. And I was like looking out, it was dark, dingy. Uh, there were only cycle rickshaws there. Uh, and I said, look, is this the place? <laughs> you know, where I moved to? Uh, and then we, you know, got onto a cycle rickshaw, uh, went to the hostel. It was again... You know, uh, little oldish looking buildings, uh, lights were lit, not on. And I was, I think for a moment, I did feel have I taken the right call. But anyway, I think we got there and got admitted uh, and did the admission process. And uh, I think one thing that my father said made a big difference to me there. And, uh, you know, there in the background is my father's uh, pick uh, as uh, luck would have it. So, you know, he he said, look, Rohit, in every, you know, every place, there are, Typically, you know, students get categorized into three typical groups. There's one group which has said, okay, this was their destination and they've arrived. So, you know, they go there and then they just chill out because it's a great place and, you know, now you have made it. Uh, the second uh, bunch of kids who will, you know, continue to be sincere and work hard and, uh, you know, stay somewhere in the middle, uh, right, uh, trying different things. And then there's a, you know, group which will generally put in their best to make the opportunity count. So just stay focused on being in the first group, where in the first group you are, it's okay, but go and try for it. And, uh, you know, that's what I tried to do. Uh, I think uh, the first sem went well. I was very scared because a lot of kids, especially from South and we, you know, Tamil Nadu and uh, Andhra had a large contingent of people who came. Okay. And... Uh, uh, you know, many of them had studied for IITs properly. Half of the syllabus that was been taught in year one, uh, the basic sciences, they had already done. So I used to get a little scared. I don't know enough, right? I had never taken tuitions. I had not prepared so much for IITs. So all these were new topics for me. But somehow it went well. And, um, you know, I actually got a CG of 10 in semester one. Wow. 
and uh, that got me uh, you know going uh, so i managed to stay ahead um, finish the second term also with a cg of 10 uh, so man. instead of taking a dual degree i took a transfer to triple e and got into the four year program and i think then uh, journey was great uh, finished off on a fairly good note at pilani so that's yeah, my journey to pilani and i think it's a, it's been a fascinating i think it was a, uh, for most of us who went to pilani and i think i'm sure it's happened through the generation uh, it is a life defining uh, stint that you have at pilani it changes how you look at things how you operate how you think and the friends you make absolutely sir i totally agree uh even my journey and to all the alumni i have spoken to their journey is at pilani has been like truly very transformational okay sir so uh please also now run us through your four years at bit if there was any particular incident that was like particularly very transformative or life changing for you how did the four years end in which company you were placed at also you i think you pursued mba after graduation so what led you to make that decision please run us through that So look, uh, you know, uh, like I said, I think to me one of the first uh, big, uh, no, I won't say event, but a thing which played a big role was how the first term went, right? And I think first few exams uh, that you give in a new place is what makes a lot of difference. Uh, I think uh, you know, uh, one, those four years at Pilani were fantastic. Uh, there were a few things which i consciously ensured i did one was i attended our classes though as you oh, know wow. even those days we had zero percent attendance but uh, i was one of the few who attended our classes if whether i was uh, not well i was uh, not, not feeling okay but i would still go to my classes uh, second i ensured that i went to the classes uh, or the professors whose class i got you know registered on to right now base this is i don't know how the system is now but we used to have a allocation system basis that allocation number you chose the professors and uh, you know so there were classes where i sat where i was only student uh, and i would sit through the class because i felt okay i can ask any question it's a, like a private tuition that i'm getting so uh, give it a you know make the most of it so i think one was i did spend a lot of time uh, consciously ensuring i sit through our classes and use the most Uh, opportunity in the class to learn the second was uh, and i was very active socially so i was uh, i started playing squash uh, i knew the game so i was fairly good at it uh, went on to become the squash captain for uh, bits we won the gold in bossum in my wow. year as captaincy uh, i was a very active member of dopi uh, the photography club uh, photograph photography department not club sorry and um, you know then Yeah, you know, I had uh, obviously was quite active in the different associations, the Punjabi Association, uh, and a couple of others. So I think I was quite active and uh, uh, you know did well uh, at uh, Pilani on multiple dimensions. Uh, academics ended up being well, so I think that was a core part because I think it was apart from just doing well. Uh, you know, I don't we the top ten would always get their get a full scholarship. so for me it was also uh, you know that as an incentive where uh, you got all your fees back throughout uh, all the four years i remained in the top 10 through the four years and hence uh, never paid a penny to pilani for uh, or to bits for uh, studying at least right so i think that was a, a good journey so i think overall uh, i think to me every part of what we did at bits i had a great time i think i made some great friends uh i continued to stay and interact with almost all different groups across batches in my batch uh, you know the, at times you end up forming a very close group early and then you end up spending a lot of time with them but i generally right. stayed with multiple groups it had it, its uh, downside that you were not part of the core group of any one group but i think you had a best of all groups uh, that you got Correct. so i think that was a great uh, journey i would uh, find so after 4 years uh, like tell us how was the placement season used to look like then and like which, which were the companies that used to come etc so look uh, in our times uh, you know the uh, generally it was still lot of the it and uh, manufacturing type companies uh, companies like tcs and forces had just started and, and they were the big recruiters in terms of numbers 
Uh, but you know, we didn't have too many, no banks uh, or very few banks. I think no consulting companies. I think Anderson was probably the only one which were just come into India that time who would come to bits, but take just one or two people. So, you know, I'd done electrical and electronics, um, and uh, as a placement season started, so I'd taken PS two in semester two. So, uh, you know, so our placements was in the first semester. So I remember sometime in uh, mid-August uh, when the placement started, uh, the first company coming to campus was a company called Analog Devices. Uh, I had no clue of what that company was, uh, right? It was, uh, in, in those days, uh, so basically there were three or four big chip companies in those days uh, globally. One was uh, Texas Instruments, uh, Intel, uh, and then there was Lucent and Analog Devices. They were the four sort of main uh, chip companies globally. All of them had a design center in India. And uh, analog devices happened to be the first ones coming to campus. Uh, and you know, because I had done electronics, I was not so keen on semiconductor as a space, but we'd done some of those courses in our uh, uh, you know, third and fourth year. So I said, okay, sound good. Um, uh, but normally they would come and only take MTechs. That year, uh, Professor Raghurama, who later on uh, became one of the director at Pilani and then at Goa, he used to be a placement uh, uh, in charge. And he sort of convinced analog guys when they were coming that, look, you know, it, uh, why don't you look at our bachelor students also? They're also good. If some of them qualify, why don't you look at them? So I think they decided to open it up for bachelors in art. I was the first year when they opened it up for bachelors. And, uh, you know, they had a good entrance exam. So some of my seniors said, look, even if you're not interested in the company, because I had no clue what this company was, or, you know, uh, those days internet was not so common. So you right. didn't really read and know about these companies. You couldn't do research so much. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, they said, okay, uh, Analog gives a good entrance exam. So why don't you at least sit for it? So at least you get a sense of what uh, written exam for, you know, for this job process work like. So at least you have some practice. So I said, okay, yeah, sounds good. I went, gave the entrance exam. It was a bit of a multiple choice. So a little, uh, you know, uh, fluke could also work. And as luck would have it, I got through to the entrance uh, the return. I got through and got into the interviews. So I said, okay. And, you know, the most of the others who were there were either MTechs or a couple of really good uh, students from uh, my batch, you know, who were focused on... Uh, you know, a semiconductor as a space they wanted to get into. So they obviously had done a lot more electives. They knew a lot more. Then we went for the interview, and there were three interviews uh, there. One was a technical interview, and the first, that was the first one I sat through. So, you know, the guy asked me one question, and I said, look, I don't really know uh, what this is. So he says, but you've got the answer right in the written. So I remember uh, telling him, I said, look, I think this because of the multiple choice, uh, I felt this was probably the right answer, so I gave it. I, you know, I don't think I, I've done too many electives in this uh, field, so I may not be very good at it. Uh, but I know I'm a good learner. Uh, that I think phrase changed the course of the interview. So he said, "Okay, uh, that's a fair one. So what I will do is I will explain a concept to you and then ask you questions based on that concept." And, you know, if you can answer, then you've done well. So I, you know, I did, I cleared all the three rounds and uh, got wow. through uh, that offer. Uh, one MTech guy uh, got a job and I got a job. So only two of us got a job at Analog. And this was the first company. So for almost a week on campus, I was the only one who had a job on campus. Uh, something oh, which I, I didn't know, but it was also, uh, you know, apart from Schlumberge, which was always the highest paying company on campus, uh, this was the second highest paying job on campus. Uh, I remember uh, 1.96 lakhs a year was the <laughs> was the uh, salary uh, that was there. And uh, I think it was a fantastic experience. Uh, it, you know, when I told my parents, they also had no clue. I remember going to Connaught and trying to call them and shouting because connection is not good. Uh, really shouting my uh, at the top of my voice to explain to them what this company is. They had no clue, but you know they sound. They thought I was happy, so they said, "Okay, good." And uh, that's how I got this uh, job. And you know, I uh, went there uh, after my graduation, worked there for a couple of years, and uh, then decided to do my MBA. Got it. So that so, was. Do you do you think being yeah. honest in an interview always works? Like, always, always. 
always okay. same happened by the way in my uh, uh, i am interview i remember i was in analog devices and uh, you know i was not sure uh, I, i knew i would like to do an mba but i was not mm-hmm. sure uh, so but i decided to give cat uh, regularly right so i gave the cat uh, after bits but i never prepared for it really so you know i did okay but i didn't get any shortlist uh, so after a year uh, at analog i again gave cat and uh, uh, i got through or i had filled only other a b and c as options and i got calls from um, uh, a and c if i'm not wrong and uh, this was i think uh, in jan of 99 okay. and uh, analog had just decided to send me to austin to the design center there for uh, one project and i was trying to go there and amdavad interview was just a day before i was supposed to go calcutta interview was after i was supposed to go so i said okay i will not do cal interview i'll just do the amdavad interview and uh, you know i remember in the interview uh, you know uh, one of the profs asked me the first question they asked me is okay, which was your favorite subject and i said mathematics you know i was good at it so you know one of the first few questions he asked me was the surface area or volume or one of these you know random shapes cubes or cylindrical or cones or something and i said look frankly i don't remember the formulas now uh mm-hmm. you know i but if you are okay i'll give it a shot i don't know that i'm right or wrong and i i gave an answer later on when i checked it was the wrong answer okay. right but i think being honest helps right because people don't expect mm-hmm. you to be perfect and you, uh, i think most companies or most organizations are looking at can you learn fast right i think that is uh, the more important uh, thing can you think properly and not so much of how much can you memorize right so okay. i think uh, honestly i have always found and now that i've been doing interviews a lot more uh, i think it makes a big difference to just be honest right very interesting sir also the uh, as you mentioned that you have been you had been giving cat even when you were selected into analog and even i think in your final year so what was the reason you were trying to get into mba look i realized uh, early on that somehow you know technical so okay so let, let me wind back a little bit so yeah in uh, my bids days as you know in year 3 people start studying for either uh, you know uh, what is it called uh, uh, what do you give for uh, going for higher studies to the us uh, gmat or gre gmat uh, g no gmat is yeah. for management right for uh, engineering what do you give you GRE. give something gre gre, GRE yeah. yeah right so everyone would either study for gre or uh, cat right uh, i felt uh, the campus time was good and uh, i also wanted to earn a little bit before i do anything further right because i didn't want uh, to again after finishing this again ask my dad okay now i'm doing my post grad can you give me money for that right uh, so i wanted to work was my clear thing so i didn't study for gre i found it very scary those word lists were like not my cup of tea uh, and cat i felt okay sounds interesting but i said okay let me work for a few years and then i'll take a call let me earn something at least and hence i never prepared for any of these also i felt look this campus time is great i should use that time to move around meet people spend time with people and studying for exams uh, for the future so i think that's how uh, i did but i i was keen that i i felt management is something that i would uh, enjoy more because it uh, uh, had a lot more to do with people than working by yourself in front of a computer and hence i was generally little more inclined towards management as a uh, area for the studies than the gre and getting technically more specialized partly also because i had no clue of what technical speciality i really enjoyed doing got it so sir this uh, clarity at that point in time that perhaps management could be a better field did this come maybe partly because you were active in the different societies and maybe at a senior position for example you were the captain oh, of squash team no no i don't think that had a uh any impact i think to me look like i said for me i have generally known a lot more strongly what i don't want to do than what i want to do mm-hmm. second at least in our times i would say choices were a bit more limited so you were not confused with so many different types of options right so literally you 
it had three options from uh, campus. You do uh, take a job, you do CAT, or you do GMAT, uh, GRE, right? Those are literally three options. I was clear I don't want to do GRE. It was too costly. Uh, it was too painful a process. And uh, I wanted to work uh, for some time. So, you know, job or CAT were the only two options. And, you know, job took a priority. I fortunately got a job early on. So the stress of trying to figure out what next was not there. Got it, sir. So, so let's now fast forward your journey to your your experience after your MBA. So I found on your LinkedIn that you had been working at McKinsey for quite a long time. So please tell yes. us how were your 8, 9, 10 years at McKinsey? What were your major learnings? And then why did you decide to leave that? Sure. So look, uh, you know, as uh, I was doing uh, my MBA, uh, that was a time when, uh, you know, consulting had was sort of the most premium uh, jobs uh, on campus. And uh, for me, the real attraction, apart from the salary here, you know, or the prestige around, uh, you know, the consulting firm was the fact that it gave you diversity of experience. And like I had shared with you, I really had no specific preference of I want to do this kind of a job, right? So I was sector agnostic by and large. Uh, I was clear that I don't want to do finance. So banks is something that I wanted to stay away from. And hence consulting became an interesting choice to go for because I didn't have to pick an industry. You could be a generalist, you know, figure it out, and later on um, take a call. So I decided to uh, you know, uh, try for that and fortunately got through to McKinsey. And uh, I think it was a, for me, those 10 years was a fantastic experience. It's a great firm. Uh, learned a lot. It is a high-intensity, high-pressure environment. Uh, but the learning and the uh, you know growth trajectory is uh, very very uh, steep and interesting right so i think uh, it was a great experience worked on several types of industries several geographies though my base was always the india office but you know worked around uh, in many other geographies and uh, i think uh, yeah it shaped or has been a bit big part of my professional journey on you know where I am today. I think a lot I owe to those 10 years at McKinsey. Uh, somewhere in you know halfway through I realized I enjoyed while well, I did uh, enjoy the strategy part of uh, McKinsey, but I started getting a lot more satisfaction by doing longer turnaround improvement type programs with uh, clients versus just do strategy. Uh, because I felt then you're at least part of creating some impact, some uh, uh, this thing than just thinking great. Uh, and uh, hence, I ended up doing a lot of long one-year programs where we worked with the clients to make things happen on the ground. And, um, you know, that's uh, how a large part of my second half of McKinsey went. Uh, but when, uh, you know, uh, we had our uh, kids, I realized that this life is not sustainable. And I wanted to spend time with family, with my children as they were young and uh, or small and uh, growing. Uh, so I didn't want to be visiting dad uh, because consulting, no matter what you do, especially as you grow senior, you have to travel a lot. And there was not a call that I wanted to take. So I decided to move out. Uh, fortunately, got a good break uh, to join uh, ABG in the chairman's office with Mr. Birla. And uh, that was then the second start of the second innings of my career. Hmm. Where, by the way, you know, as one of the roles in my uh, that I did was uh, to help him uh, oversee uh, Bits Pilani as uh, you know he was a chancellor. So from his office, oh. I used to look at Bits Pilani for a few years, and oh, wow. it was a great, um, great, great journey. Back into bits uh, for me. Yeah. Uh, after about almost 10, 15 years. Right. Right. So, so what was your major learning or let's say the biggest learning from your stint at McKenzie? So I think two things. One, um, or let me say, McKenzie used to always say three things. So let me try and uh, share three learnings. I think one was uh, you got uh, you got a good practice of looking at an industry and quickly getting a sense of the key drivers in the industry, right? So uh, as a outcome of that, 
whenever I move, transition, a new industry and try to figure out how it works, what are the key things, doesn't scare me. I'm very comfortable getting into a new industry and, uh, you know, uh, finding my way around in the first week, 10 days of joining that industry. The second is sharpness in thinking and problem solving. Uh, right, I think problem solving is one of the core, if not the core uh, uh, skill at uh, McKinsey. And I think that of identifying what problem to solve and what is the real problem to be solved, I would say, and then solving it or getting it solved uh, was, I think, an important learning, which included a lot of prioritizing where to spend time and effort on, right, which has helped me a lot in my uh, journeys so far. And the third is people skills, right? Um, I think uh, that is perhaps one of the most important skills, especially as you grow senior in organizations. And uh, McKinsey gave a lot of training and a lot of experience to try and develop your skills if you wanted to develop those skills because you were dealing with clients from all different types of industries, all different types of uh, backgrounds, age profiles, uh, you know, and, you know, you had to get to know each of them to really be effective, right? Because you, as a consultant, uh, you are never the one doing things. You have to get others to do it, right? And mm -hmm. convincing someone else to do something which they may, may not uh, fully believe in uh, takes a lot of uh, effort and uh, understanding of human behavior to be able to uh, get that going. And I think that was a great, great learning uh, that I've taken from my journey at McKinsey. Got it. Understood, sir. Very interesting. So, sir, after your McKinsey, uh, I see that you have been almost always associated with the Birla Group, like some company of the Birla Group. So, like, please tell us what do you like the most about Birla Group and, like, uh, your whole experience working with them in, I, I guess, more than a decade. So, what was it? So look, uh, you know, I when I was leaving McKinsey, uh, I looked at different options. I never worked with the Birla Group at while I was at McKinsey. Okay. Uh, but when this role came of working with Mr. Birla, I thought, look, it's a great opportunity to get a start. Uh, uh, I, you know, he had interviewed me for that role and that was the first time I met him. And I just felt, look, whether I stay on or no, this role, at least working with him, is something that will teach me a lot. Working so closely with someone who's built uh, such a uh, strong uh, business portfolio. So I took that plunge to come to ABG. I am a bit of a, uh, you know, long innings guy. So I'm not a person who is, even at McKinsey, I was there for 10 years. If I had not done my MBA, I would have probably stayed on at Analog for a longer time. So I'm not one of your job hoppers. Uh, in general, right? I am one of those who feels that no matter which company, once you've chosen the first company right, uh, try your best to create opportunities in that company for yourself uh, versus try and look for opportunities outside. So that's a broad thinking I have always uh, followed. So one of the reasons of, you know, of coming to ABG apart from uh, you know trying this opportunity of working with Mr. Birla was the group is very diverse and has a fair bit of manufacturing industrial type operation, which I was a little more interested in compared to some of the tech side stuff. And hence I thought, look, uh, you know, uh, coming in here, I would have an opportunity to, to transition into one of the, uh, you know, businesses at some point. And it is diverse enough for me to try different businesses, right? Uh, because I was joining ABG as a group, not a company of ABG. I was joining ABG as a group. Okay. I'm a group resource who can move around. And, uh, you know, hence I felt the group will give me the diversity uh, of roles if I do well. And hence I decided to uh, move uh, to ABG. And I think to me, uh, two, three things which I find great about this group. One is, of course, I think Mr. Birla and the way he has led the group is just phenomenal. Uh, so he's inspiring in uh, many ways uh, for everyone uh, who's interacted with him. Second, I think it's a group which uh, 
respects and believes in people, uh, which I can't say for many other groups uh, in the country. Right? So I think here, uh, what I've found as a very important part of a culture is the respect for people. Right? Uh, and not just respect for the talent, but respect for people. And I think that's a very important part. Because to me, management is not about taking a great set, great set of people and doing great things. Right? I think to me, leadership and management is about taking an average set of people and doing something great. And I think that's where I feel uh, the group is very strong at. Uh, and the third is, uh, you know, I think it's a group which is a bit conservative, <clears throat> but uh, very patient and focused on mid and long-term value creation. So we don't do things with a very short-term perspective in mind or something that sounds newsworthy today, but you know, is not right for the larger organization. So I think we are a little more patient and we build things that last. Uh, we don't build to sell, right? And I think that's a very different uh, mindset to operate in. And I think that something that I enjoy doing. So, yeah. So I think those are the three things that I would say are great. Uh, and, and I think, and apart from that, I would say it's given a great platform, uh, you know, uh, for someone like me who came with, Practically zero operating experience. I got catapulted into an operating PL role uh, after my chairman office role, and, and now the second one I am doing. And you know, it's given me a, a great big platform to try and make a difference. And hopefully, I'm making reasonable impact to justify that fail. So very interesting, sir. Very impressive. So please tell us about that day when you got the news that you were being promoted to the position of chairman and CEO. Like, what was that day? And did you feel maybe slightly nervous? Or what was going on to going on through your mind when you got this news that you are being promoted? For the copper role or for the insulator role? For the insulator role. Because that happened earlier, right? Yes, yes. So look, uh, you know, after uh, I finished about three, four years in the chairman office, uh, in one of my conversations uh, with Mr. Billa, I checked with him and saying, look, you know, uh, uh, I'm here for some more time, but I would like to move into an operating role. And he said, yeah, I think supportive. Yeah, you've uh, done enough here. So start figuring out what you want to do and, uh, you know, also start building your replacement and team here. So, you know, I had started working on that uh, well in uh, advance. And then uh, this opportunity came for, uh, you know, you know, there was a transition that was happening um, in the insulator business. And uh, the business uh, head there, uh, you know, one day in just a can conversation came and asked, do you want to do this? And uh, I, you know, I didn't know, I would say, to be honest, I didn't know the insulator business well. But I said, yeah, you know, it's a, uh, it's a, it sounds like an interesting role. Let's, uh, you know, I would love to do it. Because for me, the thinking was I've never done an operating role. So let me uh, get into this business and try out, uh, you know, how I perform an operating role. And at least from what from the outside, what I saw was it's a it's a small business. So it was not a very, very big business. It was a five six hundred crore business. Uh, it was the largest in India as insulators. ABG was uh, and is the biggest insulator company in India and fourth globally. But uh, it's a small industry and sector. But I thought, okay, uh, it's a small enough business. So if I go wrong, uh, the group doesn't get you know hurt so badly. So it's a small enough play field for me to experiment and try different things. Uh, for me, it was a great learning opportunity. So I said, look, I need to learn and understand how to get things done, how to um, operate and uh, perform in a uh, live role versus advisory role. Uh, so let's go and give it a shot. So, uh, you know, I went to Mr. Billa and said, look, uh, this role has come and I think uh, it sounds interesting. If you are okay with me uh, taking on, I would love to do it. So he said, look, Rohit, uh, this is a very tough business because, uh, you know, and a uh, very old school type business. It's very manual plants, uh, old plants uh, that we have. Uh, are you sure you want to do it? So I said, yeah, Mr. Billa, you know, if you are okay, giving me a chance, I would like to see what difference I can make here. So he said, have you seen a plant? I said, no, I've not been to the plant. So he said, okay, first you go and see the plant and uh, then we'll talk. So I said, okay. So I went, I went to one of the plants. There were two plants, one in uh, near Bar uh, Baroda and one near uh, one in Calcutta. So I said, okay, let me go to the Baroda plant. I went there, I saw it. Uh, yes, it was a very manual operation, insulators. And we are generally into porcelain 
insulators and it was a very uh, manual uh, little bit of a dusty environment type plant because you're dealing with clay and uh, sand right so it is by default uh, the same okay but i said yeah i think there's lots that i could do guys i came back and told mr villa yes i have seen the plant and i still would want to take it on so he i think two three times he tried to tell me think no bro it's a tough business are you sure and because i think his uh, thing was he's generally protective of his talent too and he didn't want me to take on the first role where i may not do well or i may struggle or i may not be happy uh, right so he tried to warn me but i said no miss villa i i'm happy to take this on and see what difference i can make and i took on that role and i think it was a fantastic uh, five years you know uh, from a learning perspective i got a full uh, you know uh, suite of learning opportunities you know it had unions uh, six unions in calcutta you had to do union negotiations with them which you know you had only right. seen in movies right so that whole experience the government uh, the largest consumer of insulators is government uh, so you had to interact with government and policy makers you know you had to uh, uh, work with some of the uh, key customers a lot of manpower related issues so i think from a experience perspective it gave me a full uh, uh, thing but yeah i think it felt great uh, you know i was not 40 by then so to me uh, taking on this role as uh, you know ceo though i didn't chase it but it was good to become a ceo uh, before i was turned 40 uh, probably must be one of the youngest if not the youngest ceo uh, in the group and it felt good you know it was a good uh, it was a good you know thing uh, felt very happy and proud Oh, this is really and amazing, privileged. sir. Okay, sir. So moving ahead, I read in one of your LinkedIn posts that you mentioned that two things: clarity of thought and ability to prioritize are things that make an effective leader. So I would like to understand from you that what are the, uh, so to speak, mindset blocks or obstacles that hinder people from prioritizing things and from gaining that clarity of thought that is so much essential. So you know. Uh... most of us have grown especially people who have come in from higher or good academic institutions good companies iq gets a very strong place in how people look at you right the better the iq the more people uh, are in awe of you oh such a smart guy mm-hmm. such a smart uh, lady or whatever right yeah and you almost get stuck in a cycle where you to prove to others and to yourself that you are smart you use your iq to make things more and more complicated okay because you know your brain can process it's a high powered processor you are among the higher pa- uh, powered uh, processors and uh, uh, you know you use it to your full the potential to make things as complicated you know do some and it makes you do this a lot right you would do some okay. complicated analysis and correlations and graphs and analytics right mm-hmm. which sounds cool but for the average person and you know you're dealing with average people finally when you're getting things done on the ground it's difficult to comprehend right and you would just right. dismiss it as saying look you know they're not smart enough right so i'm doing the thinking for them Uh, that is a very strong and powerful subconscious uh training uh, and conditioning that most of us end up going through that you have to use your iq to make things uh, do complex analytics mm-hmm. whereas i have come to believe that leadership is a lot about using your iq to make things simple for the average person right and make it it easier for them to understand and follow and that is where iq is really tested and not by making uh, doing complex analysis and analytics and processing in your mind right um, because unless the man on the front line understands why you're doing what you're doing you know they are just someone who's whose body you are using arms and legs you are using 
right? Mm -hmm. uh, but leadership is about being able to use not just the body, uh, but the heart and the brain of the front row, mm -hmm. right? And uh, getting the maximum out of the mind, the heart, and the body of an employee is where the secret sauce lies. And not just in use, using your intellect to solve all the problems and let others just implement. Right? Uh, so this top-down hierarchical thinking that generally organizations have been uh, uh, you know, following is or is based on the fact that you are saying a few people are doing the thinking and everyone else is just executing. Right? So you're not using the brain power. So think of it as a uh, one supercomputer uh, or one mother computer looking at you know uh, dummy computers operating and doing doing some work, right? It's not as powerful as, uh, you know, a computer which has all the other computers are also smart and then you are connected with all of them to get the maximum out of them. So I think that one shift is something that I feel and believe in strongly. And that has been one of the changes and ways of management which I've been trying to champion and change uh, to use the full potential of the team that I lead, right? Cool. And I think one uh, big articulation, which I remember in McKinsey, we used to use sometimes uh, as a uh, way of thinking was, you know, initially when you joined McKinsey, you have to do a lot of problem solving as an initial consultant. But as you grow, one of the shifts you have to go through mentally is to recognize that your job is not to solve problems. Your job is to get problems solved. And that, I think, is a very big difference in how you operate. If you okay. keep the burden of solving the problem, your mind is just focused on the problem. Whereas if you focus on getting the problem solved, no matter who is, you know, you are able to leverage the best of everyone who's around and who can contribute to it. Right, And I think that shift, if you're able to make, you can be a very effective leader, specifically for roles which involve a lot more people. Right, So if you're a trader or you're an investment banker, you know maybe your job remains you know, uh, very focused to a few people. You, know, you can do the regular stuff. But in a management role, in a leadership role, especially in a manufacturing type sector where you're dealing with lots of people, you have to do this to simplify, make things easier, make people go directionally in the right direction and then a little bit fine tuning you can always do later understood so next uh, moving on to a very short segment on current affairs so like we only want to touch two topics inside this segment one is about the currently going recession in the world although india is kind of almost unaffected with the recession but still uh, how do you see the current recession do you think india is going to enter into a state of recession or how is the world like globally dealing with it? Like any thoughts on that? I think one, by and large, if you look at the latest statistics, world is still growing at 2-3%. So it is not actually going right. through a recession. There are parts which are going through a challenge, but overall the growth seems to be still fairly okay. Uh, having said that, yes, I think there are strong headwinds in Europe. Uh, US, uh, you know, though doing well, but, you know, facing some challenges. So, yeah, I think as a world economy, we are going through a lot of restructuring that is happening, both in the manufacturing and supply chains, as well as uh, geopolitical alignment and uh, interactions. Uh, and in all this, India is <clears throat> probably the, you know, we are fortunate to be in a place where we are uh, uh, well-placed to see a, great two, three decades if we do it right, right? So that opportunity exists. Okay. Uh, and, you know, I think a large uh, credit to the government and the way they've taken some po tough policy decisions to set the right base for driving this growth <clears throat> in terms of what they're doing. So I think one, I do see uh, India and India's role in the next uh, 10, 10, 12 years will be very uh, important in the global economic uh, 
landscape and hence a lot of opportunity for everyone here to contribute and do well. Uh, second, you know, I think uh, we have to realize that, you know, with the way demographics are placed today, India will be the largest contributor contributor to the world uh, uh, working age population, right, and the workforce. So I think if I'm not wrong, about 25 to 30 percent of the world's working age population by 2040 will be Indian, right, oh, wow. followed by Africa, which will be about 25 percent and then other parts. So that is demographically already pre-decided. Pre-decided, uh, pre right? Because right. people, the workforce of 2040 is already born. Uh, you know, unless there is a mass extinction, that is going to change. So, you know, we are going to be the largest uh, working age population in 20 years. Right. So the opportunity as well as the task ahead of us is to ensure that we create enough jobs for these people to create value. Okay. Hmm. And one of the areas... Uh, where we will have to figure out how to ensure we do that is to drive manufacturing. Uh, not just for manufacturing for India, but also for exports. So we have to be able to create enough strong manufacturing growth in the country to be able to uh, both uh, you know make products for us, but also for the world in an energy efficient manner. We may not, we don't have the luxury to be as resource intensive as the West has been uh, in driving this growth. So we have to be smart about it. We have to be efficient about it. But we still have to create it. Right? And I think that to me is the real uh, uh, opportunity for us as a country to work towards. And I think we are working, you know, we are beginning to create the right uh, noise. Uh, you know. And I think the other strong positive factor for us is, you know, we are getting into a phase where IT and digital and AI will help create a stronger manufacturing supply chain and services sectors and you know given our strength in it uh, this is a great opportunity for us to leapfrog uh, you know a, a few uh, generations compared to other parts of the world to drive industrial automation and manufacturing automation and innovation uh, that will help accelerate our uh, growth uh, you know, as a country and on the GDP. Got it. And sir, so as you have been in the industry for a fair amount of time, what do you think are the current challenges as well as some improvements that the manufacturing industry in India need? So I think one, uh, you know, uh, we are, uh, there's still a fair bit of work to be done in making our manufacturing competitive. Uh, two, three things that do play a bit of a challenging are laws and regulations are still uh, a bit onerous, uh, you know, and still very a bit historic uh, in how they are structured. While a lot of effort has been done to clean them up and make them simpler, but there's still a lot more work to be done on that uh, to make it uh, buoyant. Uh, I think second is, um, uh, you know, we are still stuck in... Uh, small scale sector uh, being incentivized to stay small scale okay one the, you know the uh, second point i was making when we got cut off was our smes are not incentivized to scale up and i think that to me is a very challenging uh, uh, you know task for us to work on because unless they improve their quality uh, uh, do things in the right way, they mm -hmm. cannot tap the export opportunity. Right? Uh, and uh, unless they are able to get to that scale, you they will remain uh, subscale and uh, not probably making the most of this opportunity that uh, currently presents us, you know, to us. So I think that's a second element which we will have to work on. So first I said was, you know, uh, you have to, uh, uh, I think, still simplify and make manufacturing and industrial production a lot more simpler and competitive for the global scale. Uh, we have a lot of taxes and duties uh, which are which make us non-competitive versus China or even Japan or uh, Korea and other countries. 
Uh, second is helping the SMEs scale up both on quality and hence on technology and cost to become globally competitive is sort of the second big area that I think we need to work on to make the most of this opportunity. And third is I think, you know, uh, we, we have lost the bus of academia industry linkage on research. But now with this startup e ecosystems and the way they're developing, I think if we are able to leverage that as a surrogate to uh, R&D, uh, you know, uh, and companies were to look at startup ecosystem as an outsourced R&D that they are doing, right? I think that could change and accelerate the way we capture this opportunity because a lot of work is happening, a lot of different startups. So yeah. if industry can give the right set of problems and create an economic, an economic environment where startups can interact with them, uh, you know, trying to solve some of those problems, I think then we have a ecosystem that is both innovative and efficient in how we uh, go forward. So I think those three things, in my view, are things that will be required, uh, you know, in this. Got it. Understood, sir. Sir, I would like to touch a very little bit on the startups thing that you mentioned. So uh, there is this general perception that I hear from a lot of people who are especially working in uh, large corporations or more older senior organizations that startups are although uh, generating a lot of revenue, they are providing employment as well to thousands of people, but still most of them are still not profitable yet and are just using the money that VC funds and other people have invested. So what is your view upon it? And do you think startup ecosystem needs to do anything to change it or to, you know, modify it so as to benefit India in the long term? Yeah, so, you know, I think unfortunately we've made a lot of discussion around startups around valuation. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that to me, while a useful and important uh, metric, is actually probably pushing startups into a wrong, uh, wrong direction, right? Because uh, more, they are they are more worried about how do they show that they are valuable versus mm -hmm. actually becoming valuable, right? And mm -hmm. finally, look. Uh, valuation comes from two aspects. One is your profitability and the second is a multiple, right? right? If you push the multiple so high, but the mm. basic profitability is low, right? Mm. Uh, then you are not creating the right uh, story, right? right? So I think you right have to equation. be able to, uh, in the valuation game, you have to ensure that you are moving and pushing as much on creating the basic profitability on which you will put the Got multiple. It. And not just focus on a story it. and communication on the story to say I'm, uh, you know, I should get a great multiple because of growth and growth potential because that is in the future. It's not here, right? Makes sense. So right. So it, it, so it, it should not become a race for who can tell a better story, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it should be about who is creating a better business which is uh, mm -hmm. profitable at some point, right? There has to be a path to profitability. Yes, some of these may require initial upfront spending. Uh, to create uh, solutions, but at some point there has to be a move towards uh, uh, profitability, and right. uh, you know founders have to drive towards that, and investors have to help them and encourage them to drive towards that. Then just looking at valuation and saying, okay, how do I get my exit and get my money? I don't care what happens to the company. Right, right, makes sense. So one of the so like I was recently uh, watching a podcast, and then it was mentioned that. Uh, this profitability thing is so very important, but still not many investors are uh, keeping it as a primary parameter because most of the investors, especially the big institutional investors who invest in Indian of Indian startups are not Indian. They are mostly West based. And so they don't see any incentive making a company that is so profitable and that enhances the whole economy of the country. They are only interested in how their invested capital can multiply, so to speak. So maybe this is yes. also one See, of the so, things. Yes. yes. So, you know, look, uh, there are a lot of these investors who are in it only to say, I need to be able to create a good enough story where I can exit profitably. Mm. Right? So, uh, you are not really building the business. You are building to exit. Right? So, if you can yeah. create a you know, hype around it, uh, mm. which allows others to come in and you can dilute and make your money. You know, that's the uh, uh, guiding force for many of them. I'm not saying for all, but for many of them. And I think that is what needs to get corrected in my view, if this has right. to have credibility. 
Right, right. Makes sense, sir. Also, sir, you mentioned that AI and other tech revolutions can really help India grow, especially in the manufacturing sector. So, how do you see the rise of AI in general and tools like ChatGPT and other Gen AI tools in particular? Like, do you see any immediate impact on the manufa manufacturing industry? So, look, there are enough use cases. I'm sure it's going to help. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, use we can do of AI to make manufacturing easier, more efficient, and uh, effective, right? A lot of automation can be done. So it has to be used in the right way. Having said that, I think there are two big risks that I see, uh, which uh, definitely will play out and will play out probably faster than the good AI will do, uh, which is one is uh, AI will... Uh, and you know, end up being used by people with wrong intentions more than people with the right intentions, right? That's how the nature of any new technology is, right? And, right. Uh, whether you look at the nuclear bomb or atom bomb, you know, they were maybe the research behind them was for the right reason, but they got right. used for the wrong reason, right? Mm -hmm. The second is as people get used to using AI, right? We have to ensure that we as humanity don't lose the human intelligence mm. right? Right. and the human connect. You know, today's generation feels more comfortable talking to a computer than to humans. Right? That is, is that I the agree. world we want to create and is that why humanity was born or mm. created? Right. So I think while this hype around this is good, it has it should help to make our lives better and efficient. I think somewhere we should not lose sight of the core reason for uh, our existence as humans. Mm -hmm. Right. That right. our human intelligence, our human connect, uh, mm -hmm. should not be overpowered and overtaken by AI. Right. Which will be right. used to manipulate. Will be used to uh, create business uh, opportunities. So, you know, we should always remember and uh, not lose sight of the fact that business and industry and economy is important to support life, right? And should not come at the cost of uh, life and humanity and other uh, creatures and plants and animals on the planet. So I think somewhere there, I think, you know, I, I think, yes, there's discussion happening around it, but, mm -hmm. you know, in the larger economic rationale and the buzz around AI, uh, it's being thrown a bit under the carpet, which is not good for uh, us in my view. For example, in India, you know, uh, we need to create jobs. Right. Right. So either we need to really accelerate how you will create so many uh, people who are able to work on AI and AI for development. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, then, uh, you know, uh, otherwise, what will you do with so many people? If, if the jobs are being done by machines and robots, right, uh, what will the so many humans do? And how will you prevent the social unrest it will create if you don't create enough jobs and opportunities for them? Right. Right. Second, uh, you know, AI is still very power guzzling. Mm -hmm. Right. I agree. Uh, what the human brain can do in, uh, I now forget the number, but in 1.4 watts of energy, you know, uh, the computer is able to do it, uh, but with using maybe some gigawatts of energy. Right. right. Now, you know, so if you have to replace the brains of so many people uh, mm. with computers doing that work, imagine how, how much of energy you need and you know, it'll compound your problem of, of uh, energy right. and environment that you have. So I think it's right. a, it's, I'm not against uh, the views of AI. I think it's a good uh, development, but we have to use it responsibly and we have to have the right yeah. dialogue and do it for the right reasons. Hmm. Absolutely. So this was, this was a very, very important point that mostly we ignore and we don't even consider while having conversations about AI. 
Yes. Very, very and you know, I'll give you a real life example. Let's say from um, yes, I run a manufacturing uh, plant. You know, we have uh, several manufacturing plants today. And uh, we are doing a lot of work on developing um, models and uh, digital twins of our smelters in copper, right? But one of the things which I keep telling my team is saying, yes, please build the digital twin. Let's uh, model the reaction properly and uh, put all the sensors to get the right feedback uh, online. But having said that, uh, let's ensure that the knowledge is not lost. Because today, uh, the workman is able to figure out by looking at things on first principles, tell you what's happening. Five years down the line, when all this is AI, tomorrow something mm -hmm. goes wrong in the smelter, you know, people will say, oh, the machine is the computer saying this. I don't know what's happening inside, right? Uh, you know, you look at our generation or you know, maybe your generation, you you won't even know what an uh, engine looks like from inside. You would have never even opened the bonnet of your car, right? right. Whereas uh, if I look at my father and their generation, if a car mm -hmm. were, uh, got spoiled, they would open the bonnet, they would know what to fix mm -hmm. and they would repair right. it and right. we could go, right? I can't mm -hmm. do it. You will not even have seen it, right? Yeah. So you mm -hmm. don't want to be in a situation where you know, people don't understand what's happening inside because everything mm -hmm. is automated and is AI based. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. You look at the human body. How many of us really understand our human body, which we are seeing and living in every day? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. We depend only on gadgets to tell mm -hmm. us or test to tell us what is happening inside. Right. Whereas there is a opportunity and ability of the human body to self diagnose if we mm -hmm. are able to stay connected to that. So I think right. somewhere that balance we have to maintain is my uh, point of view. Interesting. So I, I, I totally agree to your, this perspective. Okay, sir. So we are at the last segment of this podcast, which is the rapid fire round. So we have 10 sure. questions for you that you sure. have to answer swiftly. So like whatever comes to your mind the, as a very first part, please answer that. So okay. shall we begin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So the first question is, if you were to place your bets on one industry in India, which will boom in the next five years, which would which one that would be? Uh, I think serious answer, I would say India, uh, because I, I think India will grow only if all sectors grow, uh, one sector cannot grow. Uh, if on a lighter note, uh, you know, I had the copper business uh, of uh, Hindalco and I think copper is the most exciting industry to be in. Okay. <laughs> Because it technically drives everything that you are uh, doing. Right, okay. right. So next question is, what's the coolest gadget or tool that you have encountered on the factory floor of any of the industries you have worked in? So, uh, coolest gadget. Uh, you know, uh, I think, I don't I don't know, I, I, not a rapid fire answer for me. Um, I think there's a lot of good automation that we are doing and uh, anything that helps. So, for example, I think one of the recent things that I see, which is great is, uh, you know, just by putting a good infrared camera, not a ca infrared camera, normal camera, which can analyze the flames coming out from a smelter. Uh, we have just replaced uh, a task which was done by a human to go very close to the smelter and the fire. Uh, to look at whether the reaction is happening or no by just putting this camera and I think to me it's very cool wow. because it's, it mm -hmm. creates a good safety uh, uh, right. opportunity for us to ensure that uh, apply, you know we are keeping our workforce as far away from the line of fire as we can. Okay. So I think to me it's Absolutely one of the amazing. coolest things I've seen. No simple, right. I, no, no, not uh, you know any breaking type technology innovation but I think it's very useful. Mm -hmm. No, oh, this was absolutely amazing, sir. So next is, if you could consult for any fictional company, which would it be and why? I think Maybe McKinsey, in a, any real as a, no, as a as a consulting company, I think McKinsey is still the best. And okay. if I had to take a call to go back and join a consulting firm, I would still go back to McKinsey. Okay, interesting. So next, what is your go-to travel destination? And what is the one country that is still on your bucket list? So, uh, I am very fond of wildlife uh, oh. and so is my family. So, generally, uh, uh, game safari is our uh, wow. go-to list for most holidays, whether in India or outside. 
uh, and uh, i would again love to go there uh, i think that's it on the bucket list we tanzania and serengeti with my family was an op, uh, on my bucket list which we just did last year but i don't mind going there again <laughs> very nice to know that sir next is if you could become an executive assistant to any person in this world who would that person be i think um, to me the role of ea that, that i did with mr birla was probably uh, not just professionally but even personally a great uh, learning uh, got it sir sorry next is yeah. no sir got it. next is uh, professionally what mat- what matters way less than what you thought it would be i think money uh, i think many times we end up taking decisions only for the compensation uh, over the years i realized that you know money is important but not as important as we give it credit for got it and what do you think what matters way more than we give it the attention family life and work life balance okay and i'm a firm believer of that and i think uh, you know it's something that we should give a lot more priority to you know, in how we live got it and so last question what's the best piece of advice you have ever received so i think i remember when i joined uh, ABG you have spoken to one of the uh, veterans of the group uh, in my as part of my introduction and uh, he told me you know because i was coming from consulting uh, this uh, veteran was also very well educated he was he got to mit uh, you know in his uh, young days studied from there came back to india uh, and he said look uh, you know rohit in this role especially when i took on the chairman of his role uh, he said you know your job is to simplify things and i think that is something which i started off in our conversation today also has stayed with me that you know uh, we have to use our brain power to simplify things and i, I think that's very important so uh, it gives me a lot of uh, mental peace where you know because uh, i'm able to simplify and make complex things look easy both for my team and for myself And, and that philosophy is uh, very very important man wow that, that was amazing sir so thank you so much for giving our time to us it was really insightful talking to you also i really like the way you tell different stories it was really engaging and engrossing for me thank you so much sir it was really pleasure and an honor to speak with you and thank pleasure. you so much okay take care see you yes sir thank you thank you man